I think it is a true statement to say that every, every person that exists knows intuitively they aren't the way they're supposed to be. Now, there's some people that on, you know, on the surface would disagree with that. I know that. I'm not, I know that not everyone goes, man, I'm not who I should be. But I think everyone knows it in some way, whether it may be buried or not. That's, I mean, that's why, why do we go to the gym? Why do we go, you know, I want to move up the ladder at my job, or I'd like to make more money. Or some people go, I need to make less money, or different things like that. But we all have something about ourselves, something in our lives, whether, or you know, I really have a character defect in this way. I need to change this. Or I need to, even people that would say, no, there's nothing wrong with me. You know, they know that as they are, they're not as they want to be, or they're not as they feel they should be. I mean, even guys like Donald Trump, who won't even admit they've done something wrong, you can tell there's still some feeling in himself that he's got he's to prove himself in some way, or maybe the thing he feels is not right, that he's not president. And if he was, you know, that would, he would feel better about himself. That's the way he should be. And so that's a really big question that we can ask is why, I think we could all agree, why do we not feel that we are as we should be? The Bible's answer to that question, why do we not feel, or why, why aren't we the way we feel we should be? The Bible says we're not the way we should be because we're not where we should be. The way different, way different answer than psychology gives you or anything else, really. It says the way, the reason we're not the way we should be is because we aren't where we should be. We are exiles. We started, you know, we're in Genesis 3. We're going through the sermon series on the cross. And any of you like, that's kind of an odd scripture, Genesis 3, which is about the fall of man. It's an odd scripture to go to to talk about the cross of Jesus. Though we know that's why Jesus went to the cross for our sins, but Genesis 3, what? That's not an account of what he did there. But I think this gets at the heart of really something crucial in the cross. But the first thing that we see here, or really one of the last things that we see in this whole long passage that was read to you in Genesis 3, 7 through 24, um, it drives home the point that you and I, the whole human race, are exiles. So what is an exile? First of all, let's not just get off on the wrong foot and think it's something that it's, it's not, and I'll go the whole sermon and we're not tracking the same thing. Um, the state, an exile, is the state of being barred or banned from one's native country. You belong at this place, and you're not allowed to be there. You're exiled somewhere else. Um, typically for political or punitive reasons, like you did something wrong, so you have to leave, or political reasons. Our exile is not political as much as it is punitive. We don't deserve to be where we should be anymore. I mean, look at verses 23 and 24. If you got your Bible, make sure you grab it open with me. We're not going to get to like dissect every single verse in Genesis 3, 7 through 24. There's a lot there, but we are going to take a little bit of a step back and see a few of the big themes of what's going on here. And verse 7 is right after Adam and Eve sinned against God, the first sin, what we call the fall of man. Man fell from his high state with God and through rebellion as we'll see, becomes an exile. And at the, at the very end of this passage, we see verse 23, therefore, because they sinned, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. Now it's just talking about Adam here, but Eve is along with Adam. It's not like Eve got to stay in Eden and Adam didn't, but Adam is the representative head. He's the husband, he's the covenant head of his family. And so he and his wife, when it says he is driven out of the garden, it means he and Eve chiefly because he failed to lead his wife well. She sinned, but he also was standing by there probably passively watching her, letting her sin, and then he sinned along with her. But they, it says he, but it, it's, it's they, both of them, to work the ground from which he was taken. Verse 24, he, that is God, drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim, which is an angel, and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So be, because of our sin and rebellion, we were sent out. 
from the Garden of Eden. You get that? They're east now, and there's an angel with a flaming sword like guarding the way. Even if we wanted to get back, a sword typically is, is viewed as God's justice or any justice. Paul says in Romans 13, hey, do you want to not fear the authorities? Don't break the law. They don't bear the sword in vain. You break the law, they kill you. They don't bear the sword in vain. The sword is the picture of justice, of you do something wrong, you deserve justice. You deserve, at the worst, to die. And so there's a flaming sword with this big, mighty angel, cherubim, who's guarding the way back into Eden, and we are exiled. We are outside of Eden. So the entire human race became exiles. One commentator rightly puts, points out, the Garden of Eden was our true home. There, we perfectly related to God, self, others, and the physical environment or culture. It was the place of perfect shalom or peace, full human flourishing and interdependent, interwoven relationships. God rested and we rested. This did not mean that there was no work, but that all things were in perfect harmony and therefore it was the perfect home. That's the Garden of Eden. Everything was as it should be in every way. We were built for the presence of God, friends. That's why you're designed. You're built for Eden. Adam and Eve were built for Eden. We're not there anymore. Because of our sin, we are exiled out of our, our true home, where all of our flourishing, where all of our intentions, all of our longings are fulfilled. The entire human race became exiles. Adam and Eve are put out of the Garden of Eden, and God said, if you, if you sin, you will die. If you sin, we no longer have this good relationship that we used to because now you're an enemy of me. You're a rebel against me. So they're exiled from Eden and then Cain and Abel and Cain kills Abel. Then from that, Cain becomes, if you look through the book of Genesis, Cain becomes a wanderer. He's in exile. He can't find a home and he's trying to find a home and this story continues. And then Abraham has a home and God comes to call Abraham into a relationship with him. He promises Abraham and the rest of the patriarchs in Genesis that I'm, I'm choosing you. I'm gonna use you to bless the world. I'm sending you and there's a promised land I'm sending you to and there's a, gonna be a great city there and there you will have peace and there you will have flourishing. So all the way from the beginning of Genesis is exile and then God starts promising, but there's gonna be good again. There's gonna be a place you can get back to and so then Abraham and all the patriarchs go, and then all the Jews are enslaved in Egypt. Then God sends Moses, and he delivers them from that slavery, and then they wander through, through the desert for 40 years. They finally come out, and they get to that place, Canaan, where God had promised, and is this going to be the great city? And years later, then David becomes the king and he defeats all of their enemies and they have Jerusalem and that Jerusalem is what it should be and all of their borders are protected and it's, yes, we're back, we're home, we're where we should be. But then because of Israel's sin, a little bit later, they're deported to Babylon. They go to Babylon and they're slaves there for hundreds of years. And then finally they get freed from Babylon and they come back to Jerusalem. But Jerusalem... It's really just an image, a picture of this greater thing because it never really satisfies. Because Israel's sin, they never do find that home again. They never find that. They're still, though they're in Jerusalem, they're still just feeling exile because of their sin. And then the Romans come and they conquer Israel. And then we come to the time of Jesus and the Roman Empire has conquered that. So all throughout human history, the people of God have been seen as both physically and spiritual exiles. We're not where we should be. We're not in the presence of God anymore. We are just like Israel. Our exile is not much a physical one, though it does have physical implications. Our exile is more of a spiritual one. And one of the things we can think about this, we're, we're exiled spiritually. And one of the things I think that can help you grab that is think of being homeless physically. Psychologists will tell you that being homeless is one of the most degrading things. It's one of the most 
It's one of the biggest things that just rips you apart spiritually and psychologically and even physically. You don't have a place to go. You're always exposed to harm and to hurt. Exile is where you're drained. Exile is where you suffer harm. Exile is where you have strife, disagreements. Exile is where you have to prove yourself. Our exile is so per- pervasive that even the good things we experience here in exile are simply images or glimpses of our true home back in Eden. Even the good things we experience, that's why we experience good things and we wanna keep getting those good things and keep getting those good things because they don't really satisfy. We just keep having to go back to something and go back to something. That's why even things that are inherently good, if you look to them to get your joy and your hope and your trusting in those things, they become an idol, they become a false god and they break you. Because any good thing we experience here is just a glimpse, it's a memory of being back in Eden with God as things should be. C.S. Lewis talks about this in probably his greatest sermon. He was more of an author, but he gave sermons every once in a while. He's one of my favorite authors. But this sermon's called The Weight of Glory, and he talks about this very thing, and he says it better than I can, so let's read this. He says, these things, the beauty, the memory of our own past, that place we want to get back to, that, God, that was good. I want that to happen again. The beauty, the memory of our own past are good images of what we really desire, But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. I think Lewis is right. That's why we're unsatisfied. That's why we we even cling to inherently good things, and we can easily turn them into idols because we're never truly satisfied here. And the Bible says it's because you're not in Eden. You're in exile. You're not where you should be. So that's where we are, but what are the effects? What are the specific effects of our exile? And we see a lot of clues to this in, in Genesis 3. First of all, the main, the main effect of our exile, hear me, friends, your main problem and my main problem, the main effect that you're not where you should be is that you do not have the relationship with God that you should have. Our main exile is from the presence of God himself, who you're built for, who you're wired to run off of. You're built to be plugged into God, your creator, your sustainer, and through your sin, you're exiled from him. You're outside of his presence And that is your true problem. That is the problem from which all other problems come, that we are enemies of God. We are exiles. So it affects everything else. As exiles, we experience psychological breakdown. We don't have a good relationship with ourselves. We long to be accepted, right? But we are terrified to be examined. We long for people to love us and accept us and bring us in, or we're, we're terrified to like let them look too close. That's because verse seven, we see this. Then the eyes of both were opened after they sinned, and they knew they were naked. Now that's not just, ah, I don't have any clothes. The Hebrew meaning of nakedness is so much deeper than just nudity. It's shame. It's guilt. They knew they were naked and they felt guilt and they felt shame. They knew they had sinned against God and they knew they in and of themselves, when they looked at themselves, they knew they didn't have what it takes. Then verse nine, but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. We all have this sense that we need to either prove ourselves Or we need to hide as much of our inconsistencies so that no one else sees them. You struggle with either one of those, I guarantee you. The person that needs to prove themselves is seen as the like go-getter and strong personality. I need to make sure people see me this way, though they wouldn't say that usually. Or there's another person we say, oh, that person's humble and shy, but 
a lot of times, humble and shy means, I don't want you to see me. I don't want you to get too close. I could say something stupid. Why do we not say things when we know we should say them? Because, ah, oh, we don't want to mess up. Why do we talk so much, some of us, and always want to be right? What's that? We feel, we know that we aren't as we should be, and so we have this breakdown, and we don't even have a right view of ourselves. We know that we don't have value in and of ourselves. Just like Adam and Eve, we're naked. I hid from you. We've been hiding ever since. The second thing we see as exiles, we also experience social strife. Our relationships with one another are so fragile. You think about the fragility of your relationships with your friends, how fragile relationships are between countries, even your family. Like something small can happen and a small fire starts and then you say, how did we get here? Verse 12, the man said, you know, God's like, what'd you guys do? Did you eat of the tree I told you not to eat of? Look, we have blame. We have the blame game right off in Genesis 3. Adam said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Adam's like, I mean, as soon as God comes, he's like, you guys, did you sin against me? Adam goes, well, it's my fault. We're willing to throw other people under the bus to, I'm, I'm still okay, it was Eve's fault. And then Eve's like, oh, 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 the only other person, Satan, it was Satan's fault. It was the serpent's fault. Like we even see these breakdowns start to happen and then it goes a little bit further and we're not gonna really get into maybe what this all means, but God says, your desire, he says to, to Eve, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Meaning there's gonna be strife between men and women, gender strife. Why are your relationships so fragile? Why do we have gender wars about stuff? Why is it that men are called to lead their families and love their families and serve and provide for their families? And it's a lot of times the very thing that men do not want to do. And the wives are called to submit and follow the leadership of their husbands and help their husband lead well. It's not what weird submit like slay. It's a organized under the leadership of someone. The husband's supposed to be the leader and the wife is supposed to help him lead. Why is it that so many women want to be the leader and put their husband down and they want to lead? Like, we have social strife. We have gender wars about all of this kind of stuff. Why do people get so mad when they're like, well, women are just kind of generally better at this and men are just kind of generally better at this. Now we have women saying, no, men are not better than that. And we have men saying, no, women are not better at that. It's like, why can't we just be okay with being, we're, we're equal in value, but we're distinct and different. All the way back to Genesis 3. Our relationships with one another. And this all, this all stems from our relationship with God. This all stems from our cycle, how we think about ourselves. We know we're not as we should be. Don't tell me what I can't do. Third, we experience physical suffering. And this is probably the one we see most frequently and that's just most pervasive and we, we just get easily. Life is painful and death is inevitable. I was talking to a friend just this morning. They were telling me about their grandmother who's in the hospital again and then their mom who just had surgery and then they are having problems with their health. And it's we talk about it all the time. We know that happens all the time. People are always getting sick. People are dying. Why do we have this physical suffering? Verse 16, to the woman, God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. And to Adam, he said, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Yikes. 
When, when God says, you are dust, and to dust you shall return, he's making good on his promise. He told Adam and Eve, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's one tree, everything else for you. The day that you eat of that, you're signing your death warrant. That will be in rebellion to me. You will become an enemy of me because I've said, no, you don't need that. Don't do that. And to do that is to rebel against me and seek to be your own king. He said, you will die. This will sever our relationship if you do that. And they do. That says, you're going to return to the dust. It's going to be painful now. Friends, God... The reason things are painful, ultimately, this can be kind of like mind-blowing and we try to wrap our minds around it. Paul says in Romans 8, God subjected the earth to futility. The reason we have pain, the reason we have suffering, the reason we die is not just like this weird magical thing of sin brings death. It's because God cursed the earth because of our sin. That seems, what? What? I think the reason is because we now are enemies against God. We're enemies of God. We're exiled from him. And he made the earth even so that we would taste our exile and not be tricked into thinking this earth is so great and everything is so great. I don't need God. He helps us see in physical ways what what is true spiritually. We are dead in our sin. So that's why we have pain, why we suffer. We know that's true. Why do we? Well, it's because we're not in Eden anymore. Pain and death, don't don't miss this either. A a big thing today that goes around is death is just inevitable and it's just part of life. And some Christians even succumb to that thinking. But friends, that is totally not what the Bible says. Death is not just a part of life or the end of life. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul explicitly says, death is an enemy. Death is an enemy. Pain is an enemy. Sickness is an enemy. It's because of sin. And Jesus is going to redeem all of that. He subjects us to it, yes, because we're sinners and we need to taste physically what's going on spiritually. But those those are not things that are just, oh, that just happens. Pain is an enemy. Death is an enemy. It will be destroyed. But, but don't think it's just a part of life. We know it's not a part of life. Death rips us from our loved ones and rips our loved ones from us. Our own death, if that's all it is, we just die and then we're nothing. People say, death is not a big deal. It just is. You'll cease to be. We know that death separates us from all that gives our life meaning. Like, if you don't believe in God, You don't believe any of that and you just die and it's going to be black. You say, but it's not a big deal. It's like, what? The only thing you have to live for is love relationships with other people. Like that's the only thing that can give your life. And then that's gone. You tell me it's not a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. Death is an enemy. Pain is an enemy. Jesus is going to wipe that away. But don't don't believe the lie that it's just, it's just, part of the process. It's just, it just is. No, it's not. It isn't just, it is. No. It's part of our exile. Friends, this is where we really get to. The the effects of our exile are profound. And you're built for the presence of God, beholding the face of God, holding the hand of God. Genesis, you know, in the beginning before sin, it says that God walked with Adam and Eve. He walked in the cool of the day, in the garden with them. We know to walk with someone, when, it's, when Moses is talking about that, it doesn't just mean, you know, we went on walks together. Like when you walk with someone, when you say, I need someone to walk through this with me. What do you mean? I need a friend. I need someone to help me. I need someone to strengthen me. That's what it means that in the garden, we walked with God. We beheld the face of God. That's what you're built for. That's security. That's acceptance. That's the fulfillment of your longings. He, that's home. You know, and if you ever, if you ever actually find that home, you'll say, I think you'll say, right along with C.S. Lewis, his character Jewel the Unicorn in the, the final Narnia series, The Last Battle, they finally get to 
home, true home, heaven. And Jewel says this, I've come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I have been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. The reason why we love the old world is that it sometimes looked a little like this. If you get there, that's exactly what you'll say. This is the place I've been longing for all my life, and I never really knew it till now. So how can we get there? How can we get back home? We don't really get a specific answer in Genesis 3. We don't. It'll take the entire rest of the Bible to explain that, but we do get hints. I think we get three hints of how you and I are going to get back into Eden. Verse 15 when God's cursing the snake, cursing Satan, within the curse is a promise. And the promise is, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring, singular, and her offspring. He shall bruise or strike your head and you shall bruise or strike his heel. Then verse 21, in order to cover the shame of Adam and Eve, their guilt, their shame, God strips an animal of its skin and makes clothes for them. He says, and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. In verse 24, he drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. To get back in, you would go under the sword. You deserve death. Justice says you can't enter. You try to enter, the sword kills you. So how can we get home? We see right here, someone's going to have to be bruised and struck. Someone's going to have to be stripped. Someone's going to have to be cast out and go under the sword. And friends, this is why we call it good news. Because on the cross, Jesus himself was bruised and struck. He was beaten. You know, he was bruised and struck ultimately so that one day all of our pain, all of our suffering would be no more. Jesus took all of the curse that God subjected the earth to and us to because of our sin. Jesus took all that curse on himself so that one day sin would be no more. Death would be no more. Sickness would be no more. Isaiah 53 says, by his wounds, we are healed. That's just not talking about physical healing now, but it is talking about spiritual healing now and one day, physical healing. Jesus is gonna heal everything. And it's by him being struck, it's by him being bruised that we won't suffer the physical pain that we suffer anymore. On the cross, Jesus was stripped of his clothes, naked before everyone. We skip over those verses when we read that because it's uncomfortable. Jesus was naked before everyone when they took him to the cross. They stripped his clothes. Jesus was stripped of his honor, stripped of his glory, stripped of his clothes even, signifying something deeper that's going on. He was stripped so that you could be clothed with his glory, so that you could be clothed with his righteousness so that you could be clothed with his honor. Jesus was stripped so that you no longer would look at yourself and say, I'm insufficient. I have to prove myself. I can't say that. You know that your identity would be in Jesus. Jesus was cast out and went under the sword. And Jesus left his earthly home and came to the earth. (laughs) Jesus is God. He came to earth below. Just think about how crappy that is to begin with. You're in perfection. You're at the right hand of your father, God, and then God the Son becomes a human being subject to all of the curse that we have to deal with, physical pain, psychological breakdown, social strife. Jesus came as the ultimate exile from heaven to earth. And you know what happened to him when he got here? 
Yeah, he got some followers and stuff, but at the end, the last week he was alive, he enters into Jerusalem and they're saying, hail the king, Hosanna in the name of the highest. And a few days later, the same people are yelling, crucify him. Yeah, he had friends. And you know what happened to him the night before he died? When he's praying in the garden and the band of soldiers come, what do they do? Peter tries to cut a guy's ear off like a goon. Jesus says, no, then they all run away. And Mark, and many people think it may have been Mark himself, one of the disciples is set to run away naked, like his outer garment is taken. He's running away like in his underwear because he couldn't get away from the soldiers and runs away naked just to get away from Jesus. He was abandoned by his friends. Peter, one of his best friends, who had just said, Jesus, I will die for you. Jesus said, I'm going to the cross to die. Peter said, I'm going to go die with you. He says, will you? So before daybreak, you're going to deny even you know me three times. We told the third time Peter denied him, him and Jesus caught eyes through a courtyard. He looked at Jesus and Jesus looked at him. His best friend denied even knowing him. His family thought he was insane. His family came to take him home because he thought he was out of his mind saying he was God and he could take away sin. It was only after the resurrection that his family was like, oh my gosh, he's God. He's our savior. He's abandoned by his friends. He's abandoned by his family. He's abandoned by the judicial system. The high priest who's supposed to be the representative of God and uphold the justice of the law of God. You know, the night before Jesus dies is the night before the day of atonement. And if you remember, what's the high priest supposed to be doing the night before? Staying up all night, praying, confessing sin, because the next day he's gonna go into the holy of holies and he needs to be clean. What was he doing the night before that day of atonement? He was arresting Jesus falsely, giving him false trials, and ultimately working it so that he would put an innocent man to death. This is the leader of all the religious people in the area is abandoning Jesus. The Roman Empire abandoned him. In every single way, Jesus experienced your exile, my exile. Finally, Jesus was not crucified inside Jerusalem, the great promise of that great city. Jesus was taken outside of the city and nailed to wood. And on the cross, Jesus did go under that sword, but it wasn't from an angel. It was from God himself. God the Father unsheathed his sword of justice and cut Jesus to pieces because you deserve that and I deserve that because of our sin. Jesus was exiled out of his Father's loving presence and baptized into his wrath. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. Everything Jesus was doing in his life and in his death, friends, was experiencing and substituting himself for you. He became the ultimate exile so that you could get back in, so that you could get back to Edom. It's it's the bloody and battered lamb of God. It is the battering ram back into the presence of God. Only through what Jesus has done. And then he resurrected from death to life sealing our new citizenship. Now it's in heaven. Now it's with God. This is a crazy thing about the gospel. We're still here. We're still living as exiles, but now here's what's changed. Because of what Jesus has done, if your faith is in Jesus, your passport has now been changed. Your passport now reads citizen of heaven. Yeah, you're still living in exile. We're not there yet, but our citizenship is there. We belong there. Now you're not just in exile hoping you can get back home. If your faith is in Jesus who was exiled for you, your citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, Jesus, our Lord. So Paul says in Philippians 3, he says, our citizenship is now, it's in heaven. It's back where it should be. It's with God. And it won't be a garden. It'll be a city. At the end, God's going to bring heaven down to the earth and renew the earth and make this great city called New Jerusalem. That's where your citizenship is. 
In Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, the writer says, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. You see what that, you see what he's saying? Jesus was experiencing ultimately our exile on the cross. Just the fact that he was taken outside of Jerusalem is even signifying Jesus was exiled so you could come home. So what should we do with such great hope? What do we do with that? What do we do with the fact that we're, we're still exiles, but we're not just longing to get home. We know we're going to get there someday. What do we do with that now? Well, this verse that talks about Jesus being taken outside the gate, let's just go with what the Word of God says. What should we do now? Hebrews 13, 12 through 14. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. For let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. See what he's saying? Suffer for Jesus. This isn't your true home. Just as Jesus was exiled and suffered, you're now a true exile and your citizenship is in heaven. So you're going to suffer here. If you really stand up for Jesus and tell people the gospel and stand up for justice, you're going to suffer. People are not going to like you. Jesus said, do not be surprised when people don't like you. They killed me, and you're just one of my servants. You need to know you're in exile, and you need to know that suffering is coming. Paul says, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not should be, will be. If you desire to live a godly life, if you desire to live for Jesus here, knowing you're living as a citizen of heaven here, though you're in your still exile state, you're going to suffer. And the writer here says, yeah, Jesus suffered outside the gate. Let's go outside with him. Let's remember, this isn't our lasting city. Yeah, we're going to suffer here. Yeah, it's not about being comfortable. It's not about getting everything you want. It's about pointing people to Jesus and helping people see his glory, helping them understand that they're exiles here and they need to be brought back home to God. Let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured, for here we have no lasting city. Isn't that great? Here we have no lasting city. We seek the city that is to come. There it is. This isn't our lasting city. Yeah, things aren't going to work well for us, worldly speaking. Go to him outside the camp and suffer the reproach he endured. We seek the city that is to come. Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Let us continue. That's why we sing. How should we respond now? Sing, praise him, talk to people about him. If you do that, you will suffer. (laughs) Verse 16, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. How How do we live now as exiles? The writer here says, Remember that this is not your home, but it will be. Jesus is going to come and bring that lasting city. Notice he doesn't say, here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that we will go to. No. Here we have no lasting city, we seek the city that is to come. God's coming here. He's going to renew this earth. And we will live in the city with him. What do we do now? We know that that's our home. We know that Jesus paid the ultimate price to bring us home. And so we live here knowing we're exiles. We live here knowing if I desire to live a godly life, I must suffer. Come on, bring it on. This isn't my lasting city. We praise him. We talk about him. We sing about him. We tell others about him. And notice he just says, do good. (laughs) Love one another. You're all exiles. You need to band together. You need to strengthen one another. 
do good and share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And when you see the sacrifice Jesus made for you to bring you back to Eden, to bring you back home, you will gladly offer those sacrifices of praise to God in your own life. But only then. Pray with me. Father God, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. I ask you to help us know, taste that we are exiles, that this is not our true home. Help us to connect all the dots about our psychological breakdown, our physical suffering, our social strife. Help us to see that all those are ultimately connected to the fact that we on our own are disconnected from you, are exiled from you, and that's the reason things aren't as they should be. Help us to see that. Help others to see that and to see that Jesus became the ultimate exile so he could bring us home as the citizen of heaven. Help us to be encouraged by Jesus' passion and his suffering, to be encouraged when we feel cast out. Help us to see that Jesus was cast out so that we could be brought in and that ultimately we're not cast out. We're, God is bringing us back into himself. Help God, help us to see that. Help us to taste that. Help us to long for home and know that anything good we experience here is just just a taste of what it will be like when that lasting city comes, when you bring it by your grace. Help us to trust Jesus and what he's done. Help us to not look to ourselves, but look to him and be changed and live. It's in his name we pray, amen.